As we know from the very early lectures of this course, one of the most important elements of Russian consciousness in the formation of Russian culture was the uh, religious feelings and the religious forms that they got from the Eastern Orthodox Church from Byzantium. Throughout many centuries, the presence of saints, the presence of the uh, Gospels, the presence of all the, the Christian traditions in the Russian consciousness was something that uh, was tremendously important and always present. By the time it came to the 19th century, particularly the Russian folk, particularly the Russian peasantry, was firmly wedded to the ideas of Christianity, the forms of Christianity, the legends of Christianity, everything connected with that notion of godliness and uh, uh, godliness is interpreted through a Christian point of view. Now, of course, in the course of the 19th century, there were critics who arose who were quite upset at the idea of the enormous connection between the government, that is, between the Tsarist government, which they saw as a repressive, reactionary, primitive-type government, the connection they had with the Christian church, so that you had critics like Bilinsky, whom you may remember from my talking about Gogol and Dostoevsky, Belinsky was particularly hard on the Christian church. In his famous letters to Gogol, he talked about the Russian priest as someone who's an exemplar of dirt, of ignorance, of lack of education, of superstition, of everything that he, as a person who considered himself progressive, considered bad. So that there came to be a tremendous fight between those who were against the church, those who considered themselves atheists, those who considered themselves godless people, and those who, uh, who had faith in the ancient Russian traditions of the Christian church. Of course, when the revolution came along, the Marxist revolutionaries were very much against the church. They did everything they possibly could to promulgate what they called godlessness. Good socialist people were expected to reject the very idea of God. Atheism was the Soviet order of the day. For a people steeped in religious tradition as the Russians were, this was a very difficult order, almost a, very, a challenge to the very idea of when to be a Russian. I well remember the very first time I went into a city that's now called Petersburg. In those days, this was uh, over 40 years ago, it was called uh, Leningrad. Uh, one of the most impressive things about all Russian cities, and certainly about uh, Petersburg and Leningrad, are the magnificent churches that were built in Christian times. Some of the greatest architectural works in the, in the world are connected with those churches. And of course also the artwork, the, the icons that are so beautiful and that are in these churches make a deep impression no matter what your own religion may be or for that matter even if you don't have any religion. The sight of these things is tremendously impressive. And I well remember going into one of the most famous cathedrals in Petersburg, again in those days Leningrad, called the Kazan Cathedral. It's a cathedral that, among other things, had, at least in those days, had the standards that had been captured from the French by the Russian forces when Napoleon invaded Russia. You can imagine how deeply this went into Russian feeling. And I was deeply impressed as I went around this building, which also, in some ways, re resembles uh, some of the churches of the Vatican. And as I was uh, walking through the church and going through the major hall of the church, I noticed all of a sudden an uh, exhibition of godlessness and atheism. I thought to myself, good heavens, what's this doing in the middle of a church like this? And I asked my Russian friends, well, what's this exhibit of godless and atheist? Oh, they said, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested in that. Let, let, let's get out of here. I said, no, 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 I've never seen an atheist exhibition before in my life. After all, I'm from America where we don't have these things. I'd like to see it. Literally by force, I had to keep them from dragging me out of the cathedral and look at this exhibition. And of course, when I looked at it, I soon understood why they were embarrassed by it and were trying to get me away from there, because what it showed was a photograph of Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union in those days, talking to the very first Soviet uh, astronaut, Gagarin. You may remember that the Soviets were the first ones to get a, a human being into space, and Gagarin was the one. And in the photograph, he's telling Gagarin, now look, when you're up there and going around the world, look around the heavens and tell me, if, when you get back, tell me if you see God. Well, in the next set of photographs, Gagarin has already come back to Earth and Khrushchev has asked him, well, did you see God? And Gagarin says, no, I looked everywhere and everywhere I looked, I did not see God. And Khrushchev said, you see, that proves there's no God. Well, of course, such idiotic approach uh, to the idea of religion was something that couldn't help but offend anybody who had a particle of sense in the Soviet Union at that time. And that's, of course, why they were trying to drag me out of that church, because they were embarrassed for an American visitor to see something like that. This was just, of course, the surface of the kind of feelings that people at that time and at that place, remember now, this was in the 1960s, when uh, the Soviet government was officially a godless, atheist regime. 
where to even express belief in God could get you into considerable trouble with the government. And here were people who were deeply attached to the idea of Christianity. So you can imagine how they reacted to Zoshinko's stories when he talks about, uh, he has a whole series of stories, talks about Soviet citizens facing the problems caused by the official removal of a Christian god from the extensive heavens above the huge Russian land. Now, of course, you could also argue that the Soviet high officials replaced, or at least attempted to replace, the Christian god themselves, as the Soviet officials, as figures of adoration. If you look at some of the portraits that they made of Stalin in the, the days of the height of Stalinism, if you look at the exclamations that they gave about Stalin, if, as a matter of fact, you look at Lenin's tomb, of course, Lenin to this very day is still preserved uh, as, as only the undertaker's art can preserve him in a uh, sarcophagus which is open to view by the public. And people regularly went through that to look to gaze at Lenin, at their leader, who had been dead for many, many years. You get an idea of how the Soviets had continued, perhaps to a certain extent unwillingly or perhaps even consciously, continued the tradition of the worship of the dead saint, the worship of the dead body uh, which had died in sanctity, which had died as a representation of God on earth. Both Lenin and Stalin were given characteristics that in normal times would only be given to a deity. But a God on earth is no match for a deity in the heavens above, at least in the hearts of the Russian people, and I suspect, as a matter of fact, in the hearts of almost any people, no matter what country they came from. The attempt to turn political leaders into, into God is, of course, a very dangerous business because, of course, as soon as that person is out of power, they suddenly become uh, de-deified this deified, and this is a very, a very dangerous thing for people trying to promulgate a uh, political situation. Now, Zoshinko deals with this in several stories. One of them is a story called Rosa Maria. It concerns a village official who, as Zoshinko puts it rather ironically, was so progressive that he had once belonged to an atheist group. You can see that with the satire that the Soshka is building up by saying he was so progressive he actually belonged to an atheist group. Well, of course, everybody in the Soviet Union in those days theoretically belonged to an atheist group. But he was being nagged by his wife and her mother to have his baby daughter christened in the church. There was a tremendous division between the official ideology about religion and how the ordinary people felt about going away from the religion. Again, I felt this very often uh, when I would go in the Soviet Union. One of the first things people would ask me in a new conversation back in the 1960s was, uh, tell me, Mr. Weil, do you believe in God? <laughs> of course, in an American conversation, when you just meet somebody for five minutes, that's absolutely the last question you would think of asking him. But to them, that was an ordinary question. They really wanted to know. Uh, th the whole question of belief was something that was very much on the surface. And of course, in this story, this fellow, who obviously has some kind of a Soviet position and is somewhat afraid of going into a church because it might get him into trouble, nevertheless is being nagged by his wife, being nagged by her mother, being nagged by the whole family. You have to christen this child because if you don't, there may be very serious consequences. Of course, he's fearful how his socialist comrades will react to a christening. But not only does he have to face the nagging family, there's something even inside of him, this, this, this rather superficial guy who has showed his progressive uh, nature by belonging to an, uh, an atheist organization, even inside of him, there's something which urges religious action. What would happen if the poor little one got sick or even died without proper christening? The very idea, of course, is enormously frightening to anyone connected with the Christian church or with the Christian tradition. But... When he gets to the church, of course, they bring the baby bundled up into the church for the christening. When he gets there, he just can't refrain from making derisive remarks about the priest's appearance, the ceremony, the very idea of the whole process in the socialist era. He talks about the priest's red hair. He says, what saint ever had red hair? He talks about the priest's beard. Uh, Come on, beardy, get on with it. And don't you dare do anything that will hurt my child or you'll, you'll be sorry for it. The, the threatening of the priest, the harassment of the priest, of course, is something that uh, is done in, in the worst possible taste. And of course, Zoshinko is making very great fun of this guy. Well, the priest finally, as you might imagine, gets fed up with this petty harassment and warns him, look, you, you want me to take your child, you, you make remarks that are, that are calculated to make me angry, and instead of feeling the, the piety and the, and the grace and the beauty that I should feel from the ceremony, all I can feel is anger at you, and you want me to have your, your child in my hands while I'm going through these feelings, think of what this can do to the future fate of the baby girl. It can only lead to bad thoughts and even future illness for the child. Well, the father says, if that kid gets sick, boy, the old beardy, you watch out, I'll beat your face in. Well... 
The priest is not uh, going to take this very lightly, as you might imagine. And uh, the priest at that point says, look, take the child away. Uh, I'm not going to do anything about this. Uh, he even starts to pour out the holy water. He takes off his priestly garments and starts to put on his street clothes. The other relatives say, look, for God's sakes, keep your mouth shut. You can, you, can, you can carry on like this outside if you want to. Let the priest go ahead with the ceremony. Don't bother him. Well, rather grumbling, the father agrees to this, and everything goes well until the priest asks for the intended name of the baby. When he hears the name Rosa, he refuses to go on. Hey, that's not in the list of the saints' names. The father protests it's already entered in the civic registry, but the priest is adamant. He said, look, Rosa is a Jewish name. I can't possibly give this good Christian child a name like Rosa. You'll have to find the name of a saint. Well, they can't do that because they've already registered the child in the civic registry under the name Rosa. At that time, a visitor who's come in you know, to see the church, obviously a man with a, a little bit more common sense than the characters in this story, uh, because he's, he's, he's come to the town, he's rather curious about how things are going inside the church. He said, well, look, why don't you name the child Rosa Maria? As a matter of fact, there's even an operette in the West by that name. Uh, that way, uh, uh, she'll have the name Maria, and that can be accepted as a Christian name. Well, the priest says, I'll accept that name, as long as I only have to pronounce the second holy part of the name, Maria, and not Rosa. And he goes ahead with the ceremony to christen the child. Zoshinko ends the story with a moral. He says, don't enter the church if your philosophy is hostile to it. But if you do go in, don't annoy the priest with stupid remarks. In, in short, use a kind of a common sense when you deal with the effects of everyday life, a kind of common sense that was sadly lacking in the official ideology of, of Soviet society. The author shows a certain rigidity and even stupidity on both sides, but he's basically urging a certain respect for very widespread religious feelings in Russia and an equal respect for the dignity and propriety of people in a situation where tender feelings are exposed. There's another story that goes pretty much along the same lines as this story. It's the story of uh, a watchman in a church uh, who is so religious that he agrees to be the watchman in the church, agrees to be the protector of the church without receiving any pay from the church. Simple salvation in Christianity is good enough for him. And then a bunch of uh, communist agitators come to town, and they learn that this man is serving without salary. Well, they tell him, look, don't you understand that according to Soviet law, he has to pay you a certain salary, a certain minimum salary? You've been working all these years. He owes you a ton of money. You go to him and demand the money. Well, the guardian uh, has enough Christian feeling he doesn't really want to do that. But on the other hand, his greed overcomes him, and he goes to the priest, and he demands the money that he should get. The priest says, what do you mean? You've been serving the church free of charge. You've been getting salvation from the church. How can I give you any money? I don't have any money to give you. Well, the, this leads to a terrible argument between the two of them. Pretty soon the, the words get hot, and the, the watchman understands that he has to go outside the church, that he's not going to get the money from the priest. From that point on, uh, although he still serves as watchman of the church, he makes it his habit uh, not to show any respect to the things inside the church. He keeps his hat on when he goes inside the church, when, of course, in a Christian church, you're supposed to take your hat off. Uh, he keeps his gloves on. You're not supposed to wear your gloves in an Eastern Orthodox church in Russia. He does uh, everything he can to show disrespect to the parts of the church to represent religion because he wants to show that priest what he thinks of him for not paying him. But at the same time, his conscience hurts him. His stomach hurts him. He has to get salvation. He has to go to confession in the church. So he goes on a horse and he travels 10 miles to the next church, which is fairly far away, in order to get salvation, and then comes back to this church to serve as the watchman. Again, says Zoshinka, look, if you want to be a part of the church, have respect for the church. If you don't want to be a part of the church, stay away from it. And of course, he satirizes those people who come in from the outside and try to agitate against something which goes very, very deeply into the consciousness of the people. It's clear that all of these stories show with what reluctance the ordinary Soviet people take up the cries of atheism and godlessness that were so popular to the Russian people. Of course, another evidence of this was the fact that during the war, Stalin actually allowed religious feelings to be expressed in, in the, the Soviet Union because it was a way of rallying the people to his cause of fighting against the Nazi Germans. But of course, as soon as the war was over, that policy went out the window.